On this episode, we visit the Köln International School of Design in Germany, their cultural library program as students look at everyday things from a new perspective. Results are compared with students in other countries. Two of the projects looked at parking bicycles and waiting at bus stops. How might a designer think about electric vehicles? We talk with a bicyclist who moved from Amsterdam to Cologne. We meet a pedestrian advocate from Nairobi. We look at the life cycle project to promote bicycling in Aveiro, Portugal. Finally, we walk across the busiest railroad bridge in Germany, the Hohenzollern Bridge over the Rhine River in Cologne. Stay tuned. We're talking with John McTaggart, who was one of the students working on the project earlier this year. What was your part in it? Um, so my part was researching bicycles and the way people park bicycles um, in the urban area of Cologne. Um, just specific little points of time, exactly when someone gets off their bicycle, leaves it at one point, locks it or does whatever and walks away. And just this tiny little piece of time. How'd you go about looking at that? What, uh, what tools and methods did you use? Um, so the, mes- the methods that we used was we just went out of the city. We were a group of, of three. Um, we got some cameras with us and we were just waiting about in places where we knew people are going to leave their bikes at. So um, areas prone to, to bicycle parking, you could say. Um, basically just stalking people, taking a photograph of or a series of photographs of exactly the, the point in time where they park their bicycle. So someone arrives, you take a picture of him. How is he riding his bicycle? How is he getting off? Which way is his leg swinging when he, when he gets off to the right, to the left? Where does he hold the bicycle when he puts it in the bicycle parking? Um, how does it interact with the, the environment, with other pedestrians, with other bicycles parked there, um, with the architecture of the area? Just looking at very specific points of the, the act of parking a bicycle. Then what did you do when you got back to the school with all that material? Um, so once we get back to the school with uh, thousands of photographs every day, um, we start looking at, at specific um, series of photographs or specific acts of parking a bicycle, and we start analyzing it. We start asking questions. Um, what happened at this moment? Um, why, why did it happen the way it happened? Why did it happen where it happened? Um, why this way, not another way? Um, And just using a series of questions and everybody's uh, criticizing the events or, um, yeah, just looking at the event and and breaking it down into small, tiny little fractions. Um, Then what we do, we upload all these um, insights, all these, uh, we call them items in cultural library. Uh, We upload them to the the platform, the communications platform, which is built especially for this this project. Um, And we get commented by the other partner uh, university working on the same project. So in this case, it was uh, Curitiba in Brazil. Were they doing the same thing you were doing then? Yeah, they were doing exactly the same thing uh, in Curitiba at exactly the same time. It was one week. We were just looking at how people park bicycles. Um, obviously, Cologne is a bit a bit more uh, bicycle orientated. We have bicycle lanes. We have a lot of bicycles um, compared with Curitiba. So uh, there was a slight difference there. Um, but still, it was very interesting to see the, the differences, um, how people park bicycles, um, uh, why, where, all these questions that come up. Do you come to any conclusions when you do all this or, or, or just a list of questions? Um, the idea was, yeah, to come to a list of questions. And through these questions in the future, maybe we can develop some projects um, about possible products or interfaces or um the idea of cultural library is basically about the research, finding the differences between uh, the cultural differences, um, how, um, yeah, how people do stuff and why they do stuff in different cultures. So, um, and then just trying to learn basically from from the different uh, differences. So we get uh, a comment about how someone would park a bicycle maybe in Curitiba, and then we go the next day uh, to Cologne and we look at that specific event and say, okay, maybe maybe. It is kind of similar to the way they do it in Curitiba. Maybe we can learn something. Maybe it, it's, yeah, we can, we tried also initiating some, some events uh, to see if they do uh, correspond um, to the events happening in Curitiba. And maybe uh, causing people to park the same way or um, just little things. 
Um, but there were no big conclusions. We did not come to a, a product that um, would solve bicycle parking in the urban area. That's not the not the idea of uh, of cultural library. So the the project is about research um, and about sharing information and documenting it. Was your group satisfied that you came up with a good list of questions? Yeah, we were satisfied. It was a very interesting project. Um, and uh, the, the input that we got from Curitiba was also very interesting um, for, the for the future development of, of cultural library. So how can we now move forward <clears throat> with, the, with this project? What can we learn? Um, can, we, can we use the, the insights that we got to, to develop something further, to uh, products, interfaces, whatever? We're talking with Stephanie Shitloff. What was your project for the uh, cultural library? Um, our topic was the um, bus stops. We had to analyze, um, look at them, interview people. That was actually some of the things we did. But the main topic was just uh, the bus stops and looking at it at um, like a micro event inside a, a city, like a phenomenon of uh, day to day life. And Yes, we focused on the bus stops. <laughs> so, were you doing, you mentioned interviews? Uh, yeah, so yeah. first step, the, the whole project um, lasts one week, and we started just looking at the bus stops, taking a, uh, a ride on the bus, and um, looking at them more closely, what are, what kind of furnitures are um, at the bus stops, what, what, do they offer to people? And we started questioning more what, what's behind all the bus stops. Is it just for people to wait for the bus? Or um, what, what's behind it all? And how do people use it and um, realize it that, that they are at the bus stop? And um, some things came up to our minds, like the question of the time that people spend at bus stops, because that's one of the most important um, things that came up to our minds, that people wait a lot. And how do they realize the time that they're waiting? And how do they play with it? Or do they just uh, think it's a waste of time? And um, we started looking around, what do the, the surroundings of the bus stops offer to people? And how do they, how do they interact with it? And um, so the first step was really asking a lot of questions and looking at a bus stop with a view of someone who had, has never seen it. So a bit from the outside and... Um, so we took a step further later, making interviews of people waiting at the bus stops. And it was really interesting, the different answers we got, that a lot of people were just waiting and didn't know exactly what to say because it's like uh, everyday action and they don't even think about it anymore. But it was also interesting to see how people um, were surprised that we were asking questions about the bus stops because it's just so, such an usual thing. And uh, it was really nice. And the interviews gave us a lot of um, feedback. It was good. And, but I think the most important thing were the questions we were asking because it was questions that didn't really have an answer. It was just open questions and they lead us to the final question that was what's really the essence of a bus stop. I mean, isn't the bus stop just at the end where the bus stops? So does it really, is the bus stop really useful or what's the essence of it? So that was, at the end, our final word to it, <laughs> basically. So what, what were a few of the questions you're asking that, that led you to finally get to that final question? It's hard to remind right now because it's, mm -hmm. uh, um, it's been a long um, time ago. Um, I think one of the first ones... We really tried to look at how are they built, the bus stops, just physically. How do they look like? And then we noticed that a lot of bus stops, just we just looked inside Cologne, so didn't go um, to other cities. And so we started with the physical aspect of the bus stop and what does it offer. I mean, some bus stops have benches to people sit down and other ones didn't have even a roof. So when it rains, people don't have a place to stay. And we thought, okay, that's that's interesting because how do people behave if there's no bench, no roof, and how does that affect the the, the time they spend on on the bus stop? And so we thought, okay, but if what's with the surroundings? So if there's a 
nice shop around? Do they really need a roof or a bench? Because people, when they're waiting, they can go inside the shop maybe. And so we start looking at all the things around and one question quickly leads us to, the not to another one. And at the end we thought, okay, what's the essence? And We're talking with Jens Grosshans, who's director of the Kolm International School of Design. What's your interest in mobility? I'm just starting a research project on uh, advanced mobility. So it's about mobility in urban in the urban um, part of the city, or in the cities, about transportation and of the movement of people. And looking at that from a designer's point of view, what uh, what are you looking at? Um, in the moment, we are especially interested, of course, in uh, modern mobility, so electric mobility or what's uh, they coming there. And it's about the designer's view is how to people interact with mobility and how is the, how the communication about this mobility is. Because I think that lots of the we have lots of interesting um, systems now or ideas how the cars could look could look or how the bicycles could be. But it's not enough about the people how people interact with it, how they understand it, and what's the communication about how to uh, use them nowadays. So uh, give me an example of uh, an electric vehicle and, and how you'd go about looking at it. Okay, an example might be the, um, you all, normally you always compare the, the electric cars, for example, with a normal car and then the, when you look about how big is the range or how much long time needs it to um, refuel, uh, the electric car can only lose. But if you look uh, closer on this, uh, maybe there are different ways to, appro uh, to go to this uh, question. Uh, if the question is how many kilometers a car will go, it's not that important if you are in city. It's better to say uh, how many hours you can drive because normally in a city you don't think about the kilometers, you think about the time you need. And you know exactly I need 20 minutes to go to my work and 20 minutes to go shopping. And at the end of the day, maybe I'm one hour or two hours in the city. And if I know my electric car goes three hours, I'm more than happy. And suddenly it's cl clear the kilometers are not that important. It's more about the time you need. And that is, I think, is a change of the of the um, of the understanding of the communication about electric mobility nowadays. So the, part of the problem may be people are just asking the wrong questions. Yeah, it's maybe not they're asking the wrong questions because yeah, they're asking the wrong questions because they don't know better. The, one of the main questions is how much time needs it to recharge, and then you say eight hours, and then oh, when I recharge my normal car, it takes fifteen minutes or ten minutes. But a good question to this is: I'm driving now electric scooter, and if people ask me how long does it need to recharge, I'm saying I don't know and I don't care because in the evening I put it to the plug, and the next morning it's fresh and new as newly born. And so every morning I have a brand new scooter which can go as long as I want. So I don't care how much time it is. And it's, suddenly this is an advantage because I don't have to go to the gas station. I can just put it at home to my plug and the next morning I have a brand new scooter. So suddenly it's good to have this electric vehicle. And the, from a, a much different angle, the design of the product itself, um, what role can must designers play in, in the design of the product itself or the challenges there? I think there's also one big challenge because this is the problem that people compare the design of the electric vehicle with a normal car. And if, you, if it looks exactly like a normal car, you will compare it with a normal car and then sometimes it's there are some disadvantages compared to it. So I think we need a new design language for uh, all these vehicles to understand this is something special and of course something better because it's totally uh, uh, without noise and it's not pollution, polluting the air. So why should it look like a, a normal car? And I think it's a backslash just to try this evolution to make a SUV now electric. and. Why do we need a SUV? We don't need SUV in the city. And now we change the SUV to electric SUV. And that's totally wrong. So I think for the, the designers have to find solutions to visualize the, the, um, the good points about the electric vehicles and not to try to, um, um, to copy the, the dinosaurs of the combustion engines. We're in Cologne talking with Inga Parsons. You spent a number of years in Amsterdam. What's it like for pedestrians and bicyclists in Amsterdam? I think um, 
especially for bicyclists, uh, Amsterdam is the best city to live in because um, the city structure is um, based on a bicycle network and the pedestrians are, I think, most of the time forgotten in the um, plan or the city plan map or organization, how the city is organi organized. It's really built for the bicycle. And um, they really have a very narrow and very good network through the whole city and also between all the cities. So also when you live somewhere out of Amsterdam, there are always like bicycle highways to the city center. And um, it's a lot of people I know who were living out of Amsterdam, they choose for the bike because it's even faster and better than public transport or to use the car because then you always sit in a traffic jam. No. What happens when you have tourists come into town that aren't familiar with an environment with so many bicycles? <laughs> okay, yeah, um, you can feel in the, in the beginning of spring, you really realize, okay, the tourists are coming back because um, your, the, the bicycle passes are, um, a lot of people are walking on that and you realize, okay, these are this must be tourists because no Dutch person would walk on the bicycle pass because they know this is a Heiliger Weg or it's, it's a no-go to walk on it. But uh, you really realize tourists are coming back when, um, because they're, they are walking on your, in your way. And you have to, you realize that you have to fix your bell uh, begin of spring or around Easter for the Easter holidays. Yeah. Now that you're here in a clone, what's it like for cyclists here? Uh, it's horrible because when you are used to um, do everything by bike, I even moved from one apartment to the other with my bike and everything is so well organized for, for the, the cycle, cyclist. Um, and then you come to Cologne, it's, it's really, because here no bicycle network exists. The city is made for, um, for, the, uh, for the car or for public transport. So um, everything is well organized for, if you're a pedestrian, you, you walk a little bit and then you use public transport and then you walk to your destination. And with a bike, you just, you have only very short parts. Uh, it's no network, it's only just gestückelt, we would say in German. Just um, short bicycle um, routes and then you are lost somewhere or you are, you're stuck in front of a, a highway or something, yeah. So um, moving from Amsterdam to Cologne and trying to keep your your bicycle habit, that's not really easy. The International Charter for Walking launched at this conference in Melbourne in 2006. We're at the Walk 21 conference talking with Godfrey Gonimote from Nairobi, Kenya. Why did you come to the Walk 21 conference? Oh, I, came, I, I came to attend uh, lectures on uh, road work safety here in Hague. What sort of issues do you deal with uh, for pedestrian safety back in Kenya? Well, in Kenya, currently I'm a student in the University of Nairobi. I'm doing human resource, but I'm doing special areas on uh, safety and health. And therefore, in Kenya, we are having problem with the road work where people are knocked. We are having buses and cars overturning every time and again. And we are losing a very big human capital on the road. And therefore, my interest is to see the negative effect uh, on human capital we are facing because of road accidents. And what uh, is, is that problem getting worse, or uh, what's what's happening? Well, the problem is getting very worse because uh, every now and again we are having uh, or a bus going up country, overturning, colliding with uh, very heavy lollies and. Uh, 
me having human capital uh, getting lost we are having motorcycles all over and again they are riding in the hospitals we have people there with a lot of injuries legs hands all over they are suffering too much what what are conditions like for pedestrians well in kenya we have a pedestrian uh, we have two type of social class the the lower class people walk to work uh, and the uh, people of a higher class people use motor vehicles and uh, therefore pedestrian i'm saying uh, in kenya people walk too much yeah they walk too much in kenya uh, are there good sidewalks or other facilities or, or what are conditions like well the conditions are not so well set like like in europe here uh, very very narrow path for the pedestrians other areas you can find some streets, people walking and the trucks are walking, motor vehicles are walking in the same street. So there's no complete division that this is an area for cyclists, this is an area for pedestrian. Some you're going to find some areas, some streets. Everybody, everything is using a common street. Yeah. Have you uh, gotten some ideas here that you'll be able to take back home with you uh, from the conference? Yeah, very, very, very much. I've got a lot of ideas and I'm planning that when I go there, I'm going to start an organization, try to sensitize people the importance of creating a beautiful city and uh, how we can share the roads, the pedestrians, the motor vehicles, and all of us feel comfortable. Yes. We're in Aveiro, Portugal, talking with Arminda Suarez, who's the local coordinator for Lifecycle. What is Lifecycle? Uh, Lifecycle is a, a European project uh, who promotes cycling uh, in, um, since the kindergarten, early age, until the el elderly. Um, and uh, Aveiro is a city who has a long uh, standing uh, culture of uh, cycling, but now it's, it's, it's almost lost and the, the municipality wants to promote it again. So that's why we applied together with other city European uh, partners to promote cycling again uh, in, in Aveiro. How, how do you promote cycling? What do you do to get uh, the... Yes, it's very difficult. Uh, we, we implement several activities within the age group we want to target. Here in Aveiro, the, our main targets were the university students, especially the freshmen uh, from the first years, because the idea was when they are coming to Aveiro, uh, they, are, they don't have habits of uh, transportation, of uh, moving from one place to another. So we thought we could catch them from the beginning and uh, make them cycle uh, and not using their, their, their brand new car because they are brand new riding car uh, young people. <laughs> so um, we, uh, in the very beginning when they were coming uh, we did a huge fair uh, the, the first week. Um, uh, we talked to them, we had all over the campus uh, bicycles uh, very cheap to buy, uh, uh, pr games with bicycles, we made tours all over the, the city to show them the places to visit uh, and so on. And after that we replicated all along the, the year, seminars um, and uh, in May, in uh, April, April, we did a contest that would win prices if they ride their bike to the, to the university. They just have to enroll and uh, send their pictures ride, uh, where they were uh, riding their bikes, just to make fun. So, okay. so you have a lot of promotion going on. Were there infrastructure needs, the bicycle parking, and other things that had to be done? Uh, yes, unfortunately, yes. A lot of things uh, had to be done. Has to be done. Uh, but uh, it's still a small city. I think we don't have much problems of riding a bike. Even if the perception of people are think that it's dangerous because uh, the car is, uh, is still seen as uh, more important and, uh, and maybe it's an excuse just to, uh, to say that I can't ride a bike because it's dangerous. But, um, 
the ones we talked to uh, in the, when when we we were able uh, to uh, to put them riding a bike. In the end, they said, "Also, oh, it's not it's not dangerous at all. We can ride the bike. It's it's okay." But what we really need to do is calming, still calming the traffic from uh, the municipality point of view. Of view, that's that's one thing we are we are doing at the same time as well with a new plan. And uh, the small children from in, in the early grades, uh, what are you even doing with them? The very youngs, we we haven't we haven't. Uh, it, it wasn't part of our plan to, to to do it. Other countries are doing are doing it. We we thought just doing it in secondary schools from uh, from eleven, age of eleven. So we we had the same kind of uh, in the open days. Uh, we talked to teachers. We made some seminars with uh, the the teachers as well because uh, uh, we thought that the teachers need to be. Um, approached as well because they are not very open uh, for cycling they are afraid they think it's dangerous and so on so we did s several seminars with them explaining to them how they could do we we try to organize safe routes from uh, from the neighborhood to the school um, advices and we work with the the first year three schools the second year seven schools um, and uh, it worked quite well Visit us on the internet at www.pedestrians.org.